Welcome to this week's episode of Compound Your Knowledge, where we cover three posts from our blog each week. This week we have uh, a post comparing ETFs and mutual funds written by yours truly. We have another post looking at rich fund managers versus poor fund managers and one on tax loss harvesting. So I guess we'll, we'll start with the... Yeah, so Ryan, you, you wrote the first post. So uh, quick question is, this is comparing ETFs and mutual funds. Yeah. And what's the big picture you were trying to highlight in this article? Yeah, the, the big picture is, at least you know, in, in a lot of the financial media, ETFs get a lot of the attention. ETFs are growing super rapidly. But mutual funds are still massive if, if you look at the bigger picture. So it, it just wanted to give kind of the other side. I personally always talk about ETFs very often. Um, so let's try to get some of the other side of the argument on, on mutual funds. Mm -hmm. And so digging into the numbers, because you highlighted some of, you did a little analysis in here. What did you find looking at the numbers? Yeah, so the, the biggest numbers were just simply mutual fund industry manages in the US about three and a half trillion dollars. In um, ETFs. ETF, sorry, three and a half trillion. Mutual funds, on the other hand, still manage seventeen trillion dollars, right? So that's that's huge. ETFs, in the grand scheme of things, are still very very small market compared to the mutual fund industry. You can look at that two ways, though. The one is in terms of flows over the last four years, mutual funds have had a hundred billion dollars of outflows. ETFs have had 1.3 trillion of inflows. So that spread between 100 billion in outflows to 1.3 trillion in inflows is why there's all this hype on ETFs. And that's the pain that mutual fund managers are seeing. Now, if you're a mutual fund manager, you're going to make some arguments against it. You're going to say, well, a lot of those outflows are just structural. They're due to uh, older, old, the older generations who own mutual funds and are less likely to own ETFs uh, are selling for income because they're retired now, mm -hmm. right? And that's putting a bunch of outflows into mutual funds that you don't see in ETFs. E uh, mutual funds, a lot of those flows now are going into CITs. That's another argument. Um, and there is one or two other arguments I can't remember right now. But but that's the general point. If you're a mutual fund manager, there's like some great reasons you can say uh, for for why there's that discrepancy in flows that that isn't obvious in the numbers and it's not as bad as it looks. Or you can make a great argument for it is as bad as it looks. Here's why. Um, so let, let's talk about both sides. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, any other takeaways? Um, yeah. No, no other major takeaways, I guess. Uh, I would just say in my opinion, I would look at what kind of the, how the market's responding. If you look at the valuation of, of publicly traded ETF companies versus, um, uh, you know, publicly traded mutual fund companies, there seems to be a pretty large discrepancy there. And some of the, some of the other actions that uh, mutual fund managers have taken. Um, so, you know, I would say, look at what people are doing, not what they're saying. And that seems to me to get you closer to the truth of what people really believe it is the future of asset management. Okay. Um, but so, so, so that'll, that'll take us to our next post, uh, which was titled fund management, the poor beat the rich that looked at if there are differences between fund managers, depending on the wealth of their families. So Jack, how did they measure this and what did these results show? Yeah, so this paper uh, digs into detail uh, through pretty thorough data analysis to come build a unique data set. And what they end up finding is that when they compare the performance of fund managers rel uh, by, and where they differentiate them based on, based on family wealth, they find that those who had more family wealth tended to underperform compared to uh, poorer uh, fund managers. Okay. So interesting finding uh, based on the unique data set that they built. Right, and, and what, what were some of the reasons that could contribute to this performance gap? Um, you know, so they looked at it like ability is one potential option. Um, what they did find is just trying to isolate exactly maybe why this occurred. Like, was it market timing? Was it security selection? Um, they found it was mainly driven by security selection. So, you know, 
I guess the poor, the fund managers who happen to come from poor families, their outperformance appeared to be driven by security selection. Mm -hmm. So that was their finding. Gotcha. Um, is it, any other big comments on this study? Yeah, so it's it's a neat paper. Um, you know, I actually dug into the data because I found I found that section of the paper I think the most interesting. So they actually built this. The sample size is pretty small, so that's one thing to highlight. Only three hundred eighty-seven managers in here, right? And they're looking at quintiles. So you know, if you have four hundred, let's just round up. That's like eighty, right? So we're comparing like the eighty poorest to the eighty uh, wealthiest, right? That's the general comparison. So small sample size should be taken into account. Second is. Uh, I didn't even know this, but apparently the census data doesn't get released until 72 years later, which means the latest or the most recent census data that they have is the 1940 census data. Mm -hmm. So what they did was these are managers who were born in 1945 or before. Right. right so caveats are small sample size and, you know, 1945, uh, you know means it's generally older managers. So those are just things I thought that were interesting gotcha. and worth noting yeah. uh, for people who just read the headline potentially. And I, I put up on Twitter a photo of Wes's 2008 Camry just to dispel any concern around, potential concern around this study. I guess, Jack, what, what, what are you driving these days? Uh, the, the 2010 Nissan Sentra. 2010 Nissan Sentra. All right. With a little rust on the side. <laughs> potentially not a lot of money in this family. Um, so so that, that that's good for this study. It's a good thing. Um, all right. The last, uh, well, ne next post we have is buyer beware the reality of tax loss harvesting benefits. Before we get into this paper, let, let's set the stage. What is tax loss harvesting? So tax loss harvesting is really just a uh, way to essentially when there's, you know, there's going to be volatility in markets, right? Markets go up and down. So tax loss harvesting is when you sell a security and purchase a similar security. And in doing so, you realize a loss in your portfolio, right? And, you know, assuming you can buy a similar security, your performance should be almost exactly the same. But you have now realized a loss that you can use against income or you can use against other capital gains in your portfolio. Right. So, yeah, we, we always are pretty tax aware at Alpha Architect. But um, as so, yeah, as investors, it's always good if you can avoid paying money. You don't have to. The author of this post claims, though, that, that tax loss harvesting, while widely promoted, is generally misunderstood and often overstated. What's his point on how it's overstated? Yeah, so I mean, there, there's a lot of assumptions in there, right? Yeah. And so I would say this article uh, is kind of coming down on the other side saying maybe the gains are not as large as some have noted, mm -hmm. right? So some people out there will say, hey, tax loss harvesting can generate 1% to 2%, right? This is showing it's a little bit small, right? And so just quick example is one thing that it definitely depends on is how does the market respond, right? So if the market goes up and you're deferring gains and you're realizing, uh, <clears throat> sorry, uh, tax loss harvesting, you end up having more benefit from it. So the market return actually has an impact on how much tax loss harvesting uh, is added. So lower market returns actually means tax loss harvesting yields uh, lower benefit. Mm -hmm. That's just one example right. that he that is used in the paper. Right. And, and there was, you know, about to making the point clear that it's a tax deferral. Thing, right? Yeah. Eventually, you're going to have to pay these taxes. So it's not some magical thing where you just make taxes disappear forever, uh, you know, which, which there's some misunderstanding around that. Yeah. Um, the other thing, he, he, the topic was on trading costs. What, what's the takeaway there? Yeah, so I think this one uh, generally, in my opinion, get, kind of gets overlooked in a lot of the analysis sometimes. Just this is just my high level. So uh, in this post, talked about trading costs, right? Clearly, for smaller accounts, assuming you have to pay commissions, trading fees is going to be higher yeah. than for larger accounts, whereby you know market impact actually is more important. But I do think one thing that's important is you know trading costs are clearly going to uh, eat away at your returns, right? Right. Um, 
And so I think it's worthwhile to take that into account for the analysis. Right. And, and that's, that's true for a, a lot of testing, any time you're testing, you know, investment strategies too, right? What are, what are the trading costs of in implementing this strategy? It's mm -hmm. something to be aware of. So certainly something to be aware of when it comes to tax loss harvesting as well. Um, then in the summary, Jack, should we tax loss harvest or not? Yeah. I mean, I'm generally still a fan of tax loss harvesting, right? right? I think investors should do it. I think, you know, it makes sense, especially if you can, you know, sell a security, buy something equivalent. Um, I think that makes sense. I, I think all this is just trying to show is that the benefits may not be as large as some people may be stating. Yeah. That, that's all I'd say. But tax loss harvesting generally is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Even if you get a very small benefit, it's better to take a benefit than, yeah. than not. Mm -hmm. So the last paper we have from this week is from Larry Swedra. Uh, it's titled D Deep Dive into the Value Factor. Larry looks into some research that attempts to explain the why value investing works. Is it because it's riskier and you therefore should earn a higher return or is there a behavioral reason? There's a lot to walk through mm -hmm. on this post, Jack. So what's the big picture here? Yeah, I mean, the big picture is Larry uh, walks through this argument mainly highlighting two papers. Right, and what he does is he does one article, uh, which is a newer one by Penman and Rajiani. I may have mispronounced the, the second name there. Uh, that takes a risk a assessment of the value premium, and it's a pretty neat analysis actually. Um, they do this by looking at you know holding your if you split the universe into quintiles on EP or inverse of PE ratio, right? They then look at if you then did another sort on. Uh, book to price or book to market, mm -hmm. right? And what they find is that, you know, through their analysis, uh, they basically find that it, it mainly is risk, right? Because within an EP quintile, right, they tend to find <clears throat> that higher book to price, which are value stocks, right? Um, those do better. However, what they find is that the up and down market betas kind of go accordingly. So if you're if you hold EP constant and you buy like a value stock, what they find is you know they generally have higher up market betas, but then they have really high down market betas, which is kind of just saying it's like a systematic risk that can't be diversified away. So it's a neat new paper. Um, along and Larry has links to some other just risk based risk based explanations showing that there probably is an element of risk embedded in the value premium. Got it. Because it's risky. Well, well yeah. the assumption there is if it's a risk that's systematic, right? Which is, i.e., you know, if the market blows up and you're buying these stocks, you're going to lose. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing you can do to, like, if the economy goes down, there's nothing you can do to systematically diversify away that risk potentially, right? So if it's a risk, and an additional risk you're taking on, you should demand compensation for that risk, which would be slightly higher return for these securities. Right. And then further down the paper, he highlights some of your own research on why do enterprise multiples predict expected stock returns? Uh, what did that research add to the paper? Yeah, so this is a paper uh, Wes and I wrote with Steve Crawford. And um, what we found is it's mainly driven by, at least for enterprise multiple, we found that the premiums generally, in our opinion, driven by behavioral errors, right? So we, we took, you know, cheap and value stocks and just split them into what we would call high and low mispricing, right? So if you're a cheap stock, but you have really good fundamentals, right? You, it's as similar to a Piotrowski so type argument. Yeah. Um, if you have good fundamentals, you're probably mispriced because you're cheap, but you have good fundamentals. Similarly, if you're an expensive stock with really bad fundamentals, you're probably mispriced. And what we find is generally the value spread is driven by these highly mispriced securities. Um, and we do find actually like limits to arbitrage may come into play as well, which could potentially keep that premium uh, <clears throat> there in the future. So, you know, kind of Larry's big picture from that paper is just value, you know, value premium. People have been trying to figure out what it, why it works. And he looks at it through the lens of like two papers, one going through the risk-based argument, one going through behavior. So it's a neat uh, article that Larry wrote that uh, those who are interested may want to read. Yeah, check it out. 
All right, that's what we got this week for Compound Your Knowledge. Tune in next week for more. The views expressed in this recording are the personal views of the participants as of the date indicated and do not necessarily reflect the views of Alpha Architects. Nothing contained in this recording constitutes investment, legal, tax, or other advice and should not be viewed as a current or past recommendation or a solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or to adopt any investment strategy. The information in this recording is based on current market conditions which will fluctuate and may be superseded by subsequent market events or for other reasons. Alpha Architect does not resume any duty to update forward-looking statements. The information in this recording has been developed internally and or obtained from sources believed to be reliable. However, no representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made or given by or on behalf of Alpha Architect as to the accuracy and completeness or fairness of the information contained in this recording. Any liability as a result of this recording, including direct, indirect, special, or consequential loss or damage, is expressly disclaimed. Copyright 2018, Alpha Architect LLC. All rights reserved.